Uh, okay, so welcome again. Um, even though this is not the first lecture of this part of the course, um, so welcome to whoever I'm seeing for the first time again in this part, and I'm again very happy to see all of you guys here. Um, <clears throat> so in this part, I guess we're going to be talking a lot more about the in-depth look of, of the features of uh, .NET Framework and object-oriented programming and design, and a little bit more serious stuff, which I think are quite cool. Uh, one, I have one recommendation to you guys before we start, which is not really related to anything, but it's something that I just came across. Um, this is my, this is my blog, if, if you don't know. Um, and last night I, um, I, I published this set of lectures, which I think should be extremely interesting for anyone who is into software development. And specifically more, um, this guy, Douglas Crockford, he is the, he is the father of the JavaScript language. And um, these lectures are all about JavaScript, uh, are mostly about JavaScript, but the first one, which is all about the development of computer languages and computers in general, um, I think are, are hello. No. I'm sorry. No problem. Extremely, extremely good lectures, and I really recommend to, to watch them. So that's a quick um, recommendation, um, just before. <coughs> OK, so uh, today we're going to be talking about some of the features of the framework, which are, are more late features. These, these things were not included in the, in the basic uh, implementation of the framework. Some of them came in, in uh, version 3, and some of them came in version 3.5. Some of them came later. Um, but they are quite powerful, and they bring a lot of uh, dynamic implementation power into the language. Um, there is a lot more, and we're going to just look at the surface of those, and there's a lot more documentation and examples and things to look into. Uh, for example, we're going to look at link queries, but there's a whole... Um, there's a whole world of, of query uh, options in the .NET. There's another library called Dynamic Link, which can enable you to write dynamically those queries. And we're, we're going to take a quick look at Lambda expressions. But again, inside the .NET framework, there's a huge implementation of uh, options for expressions that can be dynamically constructed, and they can be dynamically parsed. And you can build your own uh, um, expressions providers, and you can use them to to um, parse all kinds of data it, and, and formulas and expressions and things in your, in your program. So we're going to look at the highest level on the surface, but there's, there's a lot more where this came from. And whoever, I, I'm, I'm sure that once you go, once you have to go deeper, once you have a project that you're implementing, I guess you'll, you'll find a lot more inside. Yes. So let's get started again. So these are the four topics we're going to look at today. Um, um, we'll just see the power of them and how they can be used, and we'll see some examples. It's not going to be a very long session today. Um, but again, just like I just said, there's a lot more into it, and there's a lot more depth to go in, um, depending on your needs, on your project. But this is just to show really how deep and how, how flexible um, the .NET framework is. And in particular, we'll see the samples, of course, in C-sharp. So extension methods, is, uh, we'll start with that. Extension methods are really, really, I think, a very cool feature. Um, because they allow you to add methods to classes that you have no relation to. Um, for example, if you're using an external class, which you didn't write, for example, let's take class like string or int, you can add to it some methods which, are, which were not built into this class. Um, this is extremely, extremely powerful. And I can tell you it's very, very useful and very usable. Um, in the projects that I'm working here in Cyfinity, for many of our classes, even though we are the ones who built them, sometimes we have relations between different assemblies. And we don't want. Um, 
we don't want to add some functionality right into the classes um, so we can wrap them up we can have our own extensions class which is completely separate and it can add functionality it's of course virtually added it's not really added to the class but it can be used as if it's part of the class so that's a that's a big big power of course by the way if anyone has things to ask uh, stop me anytime and ask questions that's that goes without saying so extension methods are defined as if they are static methods and uh, they um, except being static there is the this keyword which is used for a special argument to the method um, and this the this keyword for the argument makes this argument act for you so if I have a this string argument to my function um, I can then use this extension on a string object we'll see how it works um, and it will be as if the, the extension method is attached to the extended class as if it was part of the class even though it's not uh, you don't have to call them through the class you, you through through an object you can also call them statically if you want to invoke the method not directly from your class it will also it will also work and of course all the other tricks of the framework like um, uh, calling them through um, reflection and all that will also work so here's an example we have two variables in our program they're string and an integer and look here we're calling a method of the string object called word count although string doesn't have a method called word count it's as if string does have this method and it will return an integer and fill this variable here and where is this method here it is we have here our class which is the extensions class which we can define all kinds of extensions to all kinds of other classes um, here is our static word count method and this argument here with the keyword this means that we are actually using this method as an extension on the string class so once we have this object in the method we can do whatever we want with it for example split it into words we can split by space or dot or question mark we'll get an array and then we'll just um, return the length the size of this array <coughs> so whoever sees this this uh, program for example this could be implemented usually would be implemented in a separate file it could even be implemented in a separate assembly um, it will be as if this method is just part of the class we're using and that's a very powerful feature uh, yep you have a reference to the object that called the method this this uh, argument str is used here and this is the actual uh, this is the reference to the object that called the method so that's that's the trick here we're using the mm, yeah this this is not the this of the class this is not the this instance like we're using this in a class actually we're going to see today other examples of using keywords in different ways for example the var keywords which is used um, for implicitly um, getting implicitly um, mm, forgot what it's called um, types which are resolved during compilation we'll see another usage of the word var which is not actually the, this implicit uh, type um, so this this here is not this to any class it's not a this this is a static method there is no um, there is no um, significance to the word this in a static class in a static method because this is usually referring to when you have a state when you have an object 
but this str here is our object. This is our s string. It will become this str our object. It's a reference to it. Um, another another simple example. Here we have a list of integers which is initialized with those five integers. And we're calling the method increase width, which is, of course, a method that doesn't exist for a list. So here we have the extension method. It will get, as a parameter, the list of integers. Doesn't matter, we're actually referencing here the interface but we're getting the list and we have we have another argument and this will be the argument that we're actually sending so the first one with the this will be the reference to our object and the second one will be a, an argument that we are transmitting we are passing to to the method and the action here is quite simple we are going through the list again this list here is the reference to the object and the object is the list of integers that we are sending here will be referenced as list. So we are just traversing through the list in a loop, and we're just changing the amount of each object. We're incrementing it by the given amount. So the given amount is the argument, the second argument, which here appears as the first argument. So we'll increment them by five here. So this will be the output, mm -hmm. the, the result. Okay, so far? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, if we are uh, extending the i list, does that mean that every class, uh, class that, uh, every class that the I, for example, not the list, but another class that uh, inherits from i list will get this extension method? Yes. You can, uh, it doesn't really extend the class, it just lets you call a method. Actually, I could call, yeah, I could call this method directly if I had the class name dot increase and I could supply here a list and an amount and call it without, not in this uh, special syntax, but, mm, but yeah, since we are talking here, since we are extending the, the um, interface, we could use any any class that inherit that implements the interface. Okay, let's see it live. Just a minute. So <coughs> Here we have our, um, the, actually the same, the same two examples that we just saw in the slides. <coughs> so we have the string, and we have the word count extension method that returns an integer and gets no additional, no additional um, parameters. We can see that when we're working with the IntelliSense and we're typing, we can see that this is an extension method. We also get it noted like this. And when it's called, we'll be, of course, getting here. And we'll be using the object as the object of the string. And the same goes for the list. So let's just debug it and see how it goes. So here's our string. Here's our call. We can step in. We can see that this is our object. And there's not many, not many um, statements here. It's all in one line, so we're going to just return a value, and the value will be three. And for the list, we'll print the list. Now. What's that? 
Okay, not sure why this was called here, but okay. If we're calling two string, by the way, on any class that doesn't have an explicit implementation of two string, what we'll get is the class, the class name, the type name. So actually, that was the first call that shows that this is a list of integers, and I'm not sure why it was called here. Um, then we have to string with a conversion to int, which will print them. And we're calling the extension method increased width. And here we are here, just going through the list. And changing. And that's all. You mean that I have a certain method? dynamically casting the result to whatever the type, the, di the dynamic generic type is. Interesting. Uh, I'm not sure I have to think about this one. And one thing that was mentioned um, is that we can call class. You can call extension methods directly. So we can call them as if they're regular static methods and just apply the right arguments, not, not uh, necessarily in, in this way. So these are two options of syntax, although this one is much way cooler. More questions about this? Okay. Anonymous types. Um, another quite flexible feature. Um, again, uh, not again, but if you're using anonymous types, you have to really think why you're using them and, and in, in what consequences, because they're not regularly, they're not used as regular types. And if you have to reuse them, and if you have to use them in more, in more than one place, and if you have to check your types and check your properties and work with them more in a more robust way, you better define your own class. But anonymous types are, are easy, flexible little units that you can store your data. Um, for example, um, this here, this point object will be initialized to an anonymous type with two properties, X and Y. So we are actually getting a point here with two properties without defining anything, without creating a class, just like that. We're using here the var keyword, which is here uh, mandatory. Uh, there is another use for the var keyword if you are a lazy programmer and you write your code and you don't want every time to type the type that you're using. You can you can cast you can just type in your code for any variable uh, the word var. Personally, I don't like it, but surprisingly many people do, and they use it all the time. Um, in this case, 
Um, the var keyword is mandatory because this is how we use for, for, for defining an anonymous type. Here's another example. We have a my car object and we are initializing all kinds of variables, um, properties, and here we are printing them out. Um, yeah, I think by default it would be, it would, yeah, it would be an integer, um, yes, I, it, it is, mm, yes, at, at least that's the way it should be. Uh, this, these things are parsed and constructed, um, built and they should be uh, actually so once we're building we'll have we will have a class generated according to the data types that we're using um, although we can't really use it as a regular we can't use it and reuse it as a regular type So um, the anonymous types are also deriving from the system object class, just like any other type in the language, just, uh, just like any other type in the framework. Um, they have these methods, equals and two string, and get hash code implemented. Um, but they don't have an overload comparison operators. So what we see in this example is that we're actually creating two classes with uh, two types with identical structure and identical data, but if we're trying to compare them, they're not actually the same object and they're not referencing the same memory block, so they will not be equal. But if we call the equals that goes through the properties and compares them, then we get true in the comparison. Another example, we have an array of anonymous types. So we are defining an array. We're using the same var. We're using the same new. We're just adding the square brackets. And we're initializing the array objects with each one with the new keyword. and we can just <coughs> traverse through them and print them out. Let's see it in code. Okay, so here's my, my car class which we can see initialized with the properties just as if it was a regular class. Printing them out. Here we have the two point classes, so they are two objects, two different objects and two different, two separate types in this case. The two string will generate um, representation of the properties, so if we call the right line we'll just get that. And again checking equality directly um, with between the objects will be will fail but if we use the equals that compares the properties we'll get the truth
Okay, now we have a composite class which has two properties, P and Q, and it will get as values the P and Q that we have defined up here, which are actually dynamics. So we can see that this is a composite class and its properties are the other classes with their values. Now we can address any of the inner properties directly just as if it was a class and an inner class definition. And the array, you can see that it's an array of anonymous type. These are uh, dynamic names that, that the compiler gives. And these are the objects. Questions about this? Can we specify the type of property? For example, mm. mm, not that I know. I mean something like that. Yeah. Mm. I think not. I think it's Yeah, but that's uh, that's for any assignment that you're doing with a number. I can make it float like this. Yes. Yeah, that that will work. But it it just uh, it just constructs them dynamically by the value. Um, you you're not defining you're not defining your property in any way like a regular class in this case. You mean if I go to one of the properties and change it? Yes. Yeah. Four. Yeah. So just the number, for example, zero with L, not long. <coughs> you mean, yeah, if I. Yeah, that, that should that should also work. So maybe not. No, you cannot reassign. Uh, the uh, for, for mm, no, that's not the problem. Yes. It's, a, it's, a it's a read only properties. Uh, Once they are initialized they cannot be changed. Once var No, no, that's okay. Um, I can define var as anything. I mean, that's the other, the other use of the word, the other use of the, the keyword var is that I can define it as anything. I mean, this is an implicit, implicit uh, type. Um, which again can replace any type that you're using in your code. If you have some very long definition of some list and generic types of, uh, of, of whatever with long names, you can just put the, the word var and that will be it. So right now in, in build time, this will be re set as int. And here at build time, this will be some kind of anonymous type given to it with some kind of dynamic name. But that's, that's not the problem. The, the inner properties of this class, in this case, will be integers or longs or floats or whatever, but they are read-only properties. They cannot be set to. That's that's what we saw here. So they are pretty much containers of data that can be um, that can be constructed. If I've ever used them, I've never used. Uh, never had a chance to use dynamic types like this. Um, because in most cases, when you have to define your own, uh, your own data structure, you, you'd probably define your struct or class. This is a very 
specific case where you're just defining them, reading them, and, and that's it. But it is a, a, a neat flexibility to just inline define some kind of class like this. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Lambda expressions. Um, Lambda expressions are also a relatively new feature um, of the framework. Um, this is a big world of expressions and expression trees and uh, parsers. Um, the lambda expressions basically uh, denote some kind of a delegate method that is being used for you. And you can define some kind of functionality in line to um, to do any kind of a comparison or, or value return. We'll see how, how it works in, in examples. I think it will be more clear. And it's, it can be used in many cases, in many, many scenarios. Um, I think this is a very powerful feature. Um, for example, we have a list of integers. And we have another list of integers called even numbers. And we are calling a method on the list that is called find all. Now what we have here is an expression that traverses our list and checks our object. And this is actually a Boolean expression that says that if I get the remainder of division by 2, I'll get a 0. And if it's equal to 0, that means that there is no remainder. And these are the x numbers that will be returned here. So we are actually constructing a new list based on some kind of rule which is defined here for each of the objects in the list. It's uh, not always a very intuitive kind of writing, but uh, this is one of the things that once you get used to, it, it's very powerful and flexible. So here again, our list and the method remove all that should remove specific elements from the list. And which elements are we going to remove? We're going to remove all the x elements where x is greater than 3. So if we had in our list 1, 2, 3, 4, we'll remove number 4 and we'll end up with a list which is 1, 2, and 3. Yeah. Um, I think I have, yeah, I think it should be iQueryable. Um, innumerable. Um, I don't know. I don't know about the relation between the string builder and Lambda, but Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in, uh, this is the most common case of using it through some kind of enumerable collection or a queryable collection. Um, so, I'm not sure about string builder, but maybe in some cases that you are referring to some of the string builder's properties, you can you can use it on them somehow. Uh, mm, yes and no. I'll show you another. I'll show you another example, uh, which is not not Boolean, uh, which is ad additional to the to the examples that were given here. Um, 
here we have dynamic type um, array. Um, sorry, we don't have a dynamic type array. We have new, we have pet. Um, so we have an array of pets, each one with a name and age. And we're calling the order by method. And we have to, dis we have to determine to order them by which of the properties. So we are getting for each of the elements in the list, or array in this case, we'll get to the pet.age. So we'll be sorting them, ordering them by this property age. So this is a not a boolean. And then we're just traversing through them and printing out the name and page. <coughs> uh, so Basically, a Lambda expression is uh, some kind of delegated <coughs> code that you can use. So what we can see here is that we are referencing, we're referencing, uh, again, the find all method, which should, be, um, which should refer to each of the elements in, the, in our list. Um, but this is a more elaborate code with multiple statements. So we will print out the value when this is called for each of the traversed objects. And we'll return the Boolean. That means that this is actually the value that we are trying to find. So we are trying to find actually all elements i, where i divided the by two has a remainder of zero, but while doing that, we're actually calling a piece of code here which does unrelated, unrelated work. So, um, you, we haven't really discussed delegates, right? I think it hasn't been covered yet. <coughs> but um, just as a just just as a test, the delegate is, is some kind of like what in C++ we had as uh, pointers to functions, pointers to methods. So a delegate can refer to a specific method or a specific, uh, mm, a specific signature of a method that can be then assigned to different methods to be called dyna more dynamically. <coughs> so the lambda expressions actually work as um, as delegated code, that means that we can define uh, we can define function delegates, and then we can use those also um, for for expressions. Um, so, for example. Uh, we, uh, we won't go too much into, into the syntax here, but we can see here that we're defining um, some kind of delegated method which would return a Boolean. And in this case, it will return true by hard code. And here we have a method which receives an integer and returns a Boolean. So we have our x integer and we're checking whether x is greater than 10, and it will return the Boolean result. And instead of actually creating a method and then creating a delegate and then assigning them to each other and then all that, we could just do it in line, just like that, creating our func. Um, our generic func, which will um, which will refer to a delegated method, and we're just doing the methodology online, like inline. So here we're actually calling calling those two those two delegated methods as if they are existing methods. 
and we're getting the results according to what's defined in their lambda expression. Mm, yes. So can we assume that these are like lines in simple plus or monopoly just simple C and they will be uh it's more what's there from the compiler? Uh it's less micros, it's more like function pointers in C plus plus. But they are pointers and they will not be replaced by the compiler or Yeah, they're not they're not replaced by the compiler. This is not taking the block of code and using it. This is used actually as a reference to the, to the method code. And you can really use delegates and sometimes it is used when you're using, if, for example, events and things. You can, you can create methods and then you can delegate them and you can refer to them from different places. Um, just that the lambda expression kind of writing is, is, is more dynamic in this, in this, uh, in this way. So you can define methods in line in your code like this um, without really writing a, an actual method. Mm, no, not always. We've also seen, for example, this lambda expression that goes by um, yeah, order by, meaning we'll, we're going to... S it will return some uh, values. Yeah, it will return the values of... For every one of the mm -hmm. objects, it will return the age argument, the age property. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, because it, why? This is comfortable. If I want to sort them by age and I want to sort them by name or I want to make my own sort. Um, hmm? Yeah, yeah, you could do it with link you and you could, you could combine the two also. It's, hmm? Previous or previous? This one? Uh, yeah, we are, we are creating here, we are actually creating functions in, the, in a way. The first one is a function that um, returns a boolean and receives no arguments. And this is the signature of the function in terms of arguments. And this is what it does. So since we are returning a boolean, this will be the return value in every case. And the second one has a signature of integer and returning a boolean. And this is the signature of arguments to this method. And this is what it would do for the boolean. So this is the expression to be evaluated as a return value in this case. So that means I can then use this delegate by name in func here, give it a argument 5, it will be sent to this method here, and it will be evaluated as Boolean whether 5 is smaller than 10. And once I have those two, I can just call them as if they are, they are functions. They are dynamic, they are inline defined functions which are referenced by delegates here. Yes. <coughs> this is the this is the structure. We have the result that means the return value type mm -hmm. or we have other types and the return is is the last the last of the generic arguments. More? Okay. <coughs> so
So again, first we have our list of integers and we have defined all um, these since we can see that this is a this is a generic um, I mean most cases it will be a generic like this list which is a generic of type integer um, we'll see that the return value will also be a list of integers of this find all method and we need to give some kind of boolean predicate that means what to match, what do we need, to, what do we want to find and the delegation here for each one of the members x where x is an integer in this case will run this calculation and this is the expression to be returned nope. so here's our list And here's our one line find filter to return all the ones that don't have a remainder with division by two. Remove all uh, works the same way. Just find which objects are we looking for, the ones that are greater than three. So we're ending up with a list with the three first. <clears throat> and now we have an array of pets. and ordering them by the age property. So they are now sorted. We have to expand it from here. You can see that they are sorted by the age. So this is the other example that we saw. Um, so we're going to find all integers i in our list where this is actually the return value that is being evaluated. But during this run, we have the right line so that we are actually traversing through and we'll see that this code is being executed for each of the objects <coughs> and in the end we'll end up with a partial list filtered and now we're defining two delegated methods so these are actually methods in this case they're already defined and we can just call them as if we're calling any other method and they will just work with actually stepping into it and all the outputs Um, there's another example, I think I put it in this file, but I'll just move it here so we'll have an order.
So this example here, Okay, in this example, I have another list of integers, and I want to convert all the elements of the string, uh, of the, all the elements of this list to string. So I can call the list convert all method and give it a generic new type. And for each of the elements of my list, I can call x to string. And that's very comfortable conversion when you have, when you have a, uh, collection in one type and you just want to convert it, convert the whole collection into another type. That's a useful, usable example. So this is our first list. And the conversion makes them into strings. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's a good question. I think it enumerates true, and I think this is related to. I think they would be pretty much the same, but I'm not sure about that. Yes, this is much, much more convenient. That should be a that should be an exercise task for you, <coughs> because um, yeah, the minimal should be should have some kind of memory w while it's running through the uh, through all your elements. Uh, yeah, we could. That's a good idea. Mm, yes. We could do order by um, but actually it should be something like that because we're actually returning the actual the actual object and we can get the first element like this yes um, but we're not using the lambda expression to find. We're not using the lambda expression to find the minimum or maximum in this case. Uh, yeah, it depends what you're looking for. We have the two options here, but uh, but this is again that this is not this is not the case. This is a this is this is cheating. Yes. But whether or not you can use the lambda expression directly to find it, I have to think about it. Again, uh, this is a trick question. I mean, this is a classic exercise question, like try it on your own. Find, find a way. <coughs> so this gives quite a lot of, of flexibility. And once you get used to it, it's very, very convenient. Uh, link, link is also very powerful and relatively, relatively new feature. Um, I don't remember if it started from .NET 3.5 or 3.0, um, but. Mm -hmm. So, rather, rather new feature. Um, that gives a lot of control over um, over collections of objects. Um, these keywords could be familiar to anyone who's been using SQL language. Um, and the beauty is that you can actually write them 
directly in your program to select certain parts of your collection, to group them, to order them, just, just as if they are objects in a database table. So if, for example, we have <coughs> an array of numbers, we can just write a query um, to return a collection out of this array. Um, the order, if anybody's been writing uh, SQL, SQL queries, the order of the statements is a bit reversed. So in SQL, we'd write select num from this where that. So since uh, even though the order is a bit reversed, it's exactly the same the same meaning. So we are selecting. We are actually defining here some kind of variable which we are calling as num. <coughs> so num will be one of will be uh, an object in the numbers array that we have. And we'll select the nums where num is greater than five, smaller than five. So we are getting an immediately a sub collection of the items in this uh, in this uh, array. <coughs> Um, this is more like a nested query, which can also be um, well, pretty much like um, pretty much like joining tables. <coughs> so we have our towns array here, and we have a nested selection from so T one will be each of the cities in town, each of the towns in towns, and T2 will also be each of the towns in towns. And we're creating here uh, some kind of dynamic object where it has T1 and T2 properties, and we're going to populate them with each of the towns from T1 and from T2, which are actually the same collection. We could combine two collections into into one query, but here we're doing it on the same array. So we are actually making them intersect themselves. So we'll get a collection of each of the towns um, with each of the towns. And we'll get this pair, which we are referring here, the T1 and T2 properties of this dynamic uh, <coughs> anonymous type. Um, here's, a s here's an array of strings and we are getting the fruit in fruits where fruit is the selected object just ordering them so we can use order by just like we're using order by in SQL queries. So, here's our collection of numbers, in this case an array, and when we run a link query on them, we're getting an innumerable collection of integers according to what we've selected. So. We'll select only the nums where num is greater, is smaller than five. And then we can traverse through them. And each of the nums is an integer. The second example, 
we have the nested queries so we are actually selecting twice from the same uh, from the same array <coughs> we're just running them um, as if it, it's a joint query and the result will be a, a selection of each of the towns with each of the towns but that we could actually interjoin any any two queries into into one in this case just as if we are joining tables in the database sorting so we can select and sort so here's our first array and here's our sorted array not array innumerable Um, <coughs> much of these functionalities can be also used on collections with uh, lambda expressions just like we demonstrated just now um, that I can go to the numbers here for example and I can use the where statement for example and I can give a lambda expression where n n is smaller than 5 and I'll get <coughs> I'll get the same result. Um, and there is another library called Dynamic Link that can allow you to build your own queries dynamically in this manner. Um, so you can actually construct strings during your runtime and you can dynamically build queries on your data in, in other ways. But these are uh, quite powerful and simple, simple for the programmer um, tools for for addressing such collections, arrays, traversing through objects, sorting them, selecting them, and that's, I think, very powerful and flexible tools. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know the internal implementation to tell you how efficient it is. Uh, was asked whether it's better to use to use those or to traverse yourself with the loop but mm, I, I I don't know really to answer that to balance trees I haven't tried. I haven't tried that. I don't know to tell you because I haven't um, tried to work with those on trees or other data structures. Yes. Yes, but dictionaries. Uh, when you're using a dictionary, you have you have basically you're running two collections in the dictionary. You have the keys and you have the values, and you can you can traverse through them. So you can get all the values where um, you can you can filter certain keys and then you can get get their value objects or yes uh, with link you I think you should also be able to yeah find the keys and you just yes. the same text. but if you decide, say which find the keys that yes this one mm -hmm. I think so by uh, I think so but uh, just as I always say just uh, 
try see see for yourself uh, more about this I don't know why this is here. Why this is here. I have one question about extended memory. Mm -hmm. Extension. Yep. Uh, we have to use this only for the first. Uh, um, only for the first. Yes. The first argument that represents your your extended object. And uh, when if you have more than one arguments, they will be the the extension method arguments as they are ordered. So this will be, the list is the object that we're working on, that we're extending, and this this from here and on are the arguments to the method that you're calling, and you don't have, you don't put the word this. The other thing, you have to make these methods always in separate class? No. We have to make any number one class, for example, best class? I think the class itself needs to be static uh, of where you're extending um, which which uh, which contradicts to the fact that you're using it for your own class if you're using it for a pet for example then you'll probably want to use it on some object and yeah Uh, more questions? So, as I said in the beginning, there's a lot more beneath all that. In, in all those, I mean, maybe extension methods, not so much, but in, in queries, in link, in uh, lambda expressions, in parsing, in expression trees, and dynamic link, this, this is a big world underneath. And I'm, this is really just scratching Scratching the surface of it. Uh, anon, anon is that, are they working with gen, uh, generic methods and generic classes? Uh, no, I don't think you can. You you cannot refer them as a regular type. You cannot get to the type name. So I think you cannot because when you're uh, when you're Using generic, you have to specify the type that you're using in the generic in the implementation. Mm -hmm. You can't specify var. Yes. Yeah, anonymous types, as I said, I haven't really had the chance to, to need them because in any case that you'll need to define some kind of data structure, it will probably be more usable than just putting it, as initializing it and reading it and that's it. And you'll have to reuse it in other code blocks and in other methods. And in most cases, you'll just define, define your class um, according to your needs. It's useful for uh, we saw last time for a graph to the three. Ah, no, no, that's a different var. That's a different var. Uh, that's the other var that uh, I'm not so big fan of. But <coughs> in any case, uh, yeah, it's a shorter way. But this is not the this is not the dynamic anonymous type var. Uh, okay, I guess that's it for now. Um, so let's